focus this morning obviously is on is freedom. What a powerful, you know, we don't think about our freedom because we have freedom. The point being oftentimes is you, you don't appreciate something until, until you lose it. And we have already lost some of our freedoms in, a, in America. They don't affect you that dramatically yet, but there are certain freedoms that we've lost. And uh, we are, we will, you know, never, we, we can never lose our freedoms in the Lord. People can put you in, in solitary confinement, but you can still be free. Uh, so th that's a key. Uh, general uh, John Stark was a general in New Hampshire during the early years, uh, Revolutionary War. I think he's up through the Civil War. And he was a great general. And he, in his memoirs, and he was writing to uh, it was some kind of a celebration, and he was writing. And he, in these famous words, which became the motto of New Hampshire, and he simply said, live free or die. And that became the motto of the state. He said, we'll never lose our freedom. We will fight to the death, and we will not come under bondage. And so you have to, it's, it's live free or die. So in other words, you have to fight for your freedoms. Now, that fighting comes in different ways. Of course, at the, at the outset of our nation, the oppression of England wanted to control and rule over these, the 13 colonies and say, you will, you will pay our taxes and we will tell you what to do and when to do it and what not to do and you will be under our political thumb, so to speak. And our forefathers said, uh, no, we will not. We are now declaring ourselves an independent nation. And of course, then we have uh, the great war, of uh, the Revolutionary War. And <clears throat> Uh, to secure freedom. So <clears throat> let's pray. Father, thank you for this time this morning to celebrate freedom uh, on this uh, Independence Day weekend. And we ask Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts during this time in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. So <clears throat> I want you to uh, look at the, the back of your notes. And there's something, there's a very interesting uh, cycle that a gentleman <clears throat> by the name of Alexander Keitler uh, wrote in 1747. Now you do not have that l bit of dialogue <clears throat> on the back of your chart <clears throat> in your notes, but it is available, or these charts or handouts are available uh, at the resource table. Uh, <clears throat> and he, he was a professor <clears throat> of history at the University of Edinburgh, 1747. And he wrote this, a democracy is always temporary in nature. It simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. A democracy will continue to exist up until the time that voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates who promise the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that every democracy will finally collapse due to loose fiscal policy, which is always followed by a dictatorship, which is bondage. So, as most of you know, we do not live in a democracy. America is a representative republic. It's not a democracy. A democracy means every, everybody votes, everybody votes for whatever it is, and then the majority uh, acquires whatever they want to vote for. Uh, but in a representative democracy, we vote in representatives, uh, legislators, and they represent us in the government. That's a different form of government than a, than a pure democracy. Oftentimes we use that term to as it representing the, uh, uh, the people's involvement in a, in, in a government, but we are a representative re republic. And <clears throat> thank you, much appreciated. <clears throat> I'll drink to that. So kind of you. So all of life uh, comes down to uh, what I say, who, who rules? Who, who rules actually? And you can apply that to a church, you can apply that to a home, you can apply that to a business, you can apply that to a community, to a nation, and leadership is important. If it's in divine order and it's under God, 
Bible says when the, when the unrighteous, when, when wicked people rule, the people groan. But when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. So if there's righteous leadership, the people are, feel secure, they're cared for, and uh, there's a reciprocal uh, exchange of, of life, and it's, it's God's divine, uh, design. But when wicked men want to rule over you and to dominate you with, in any one of those areas, whether it's a church or it's a home or it's out of divine order, uh, there's turbulence and there's oftentimes chaos. So this gentleman, Alexander Teitler, came up with this, and you'll look at it for a moment, take a moment to see this. At, ver at the very top, it begins with bondage. And it, see, in life, people, the, and I say the, the normal state, the, uh, freedom is not the normal condition of mankind. The normal condition of mankind is actually bondage. From the, you, you think about history, the history of, of nations, from back from with Nimrod, Nimrod it was to, to dominate to dominate the people to control control the people, and of course with with the uh, the powers of darkness operating through governments, they want to oppress and suppress the people. And that's the normal condition. If you look out through all the nations of even today across the world, most of them are in some kind of tyranny or oppression by a, a government. That's the normal state of man. So it begins with bondage, and it says people, next to that, people oppose the conditions. They become uh, disturbed by what's going on because people are sense that they are born to be free. And being in bondage ultimately begins to disturb them mentally and emotionally to the next step, which is, which is faith. And that is a search for unity and deep moral gatherings. Uh, now, I, I think, and this is maybe a little bit different application, but the way America is moving, that people are sensing that they are in more bondage from the, uh, from the, from the uh, changing ethics and morals of the nation that are allowing certain types of behavior and national uh, turmoil is now encroaching itself on the nation, and people are getting disturbed by that. They're feeling there, there's an oppression that's developing in, the, in this nation that's generally free, but there's something changing. And so faith begins to well up. And then the next is courage, which people fight for freedom. Now that's in America, the American Revolution, where they were gonna fight for the, for, for the, for the cause. And then we have our great uh, leaders uh, coming out of that, George Washington and others, they say, no, we're, there's actually going to be a physical fight. We're, we're, we're going to ask for freedom. We're going to be very gracious about it. But if you will not let us go, we will fight. Uh, we think back to Moses and, and the people of Israel. Say, well, we'll let my people go. Why? Because we're in bondage. It was, a for, it was slavery. Slavery is not just a modern phenomenon. That has been around for forever. And of course, the Jewish people, and for 400 years, were in were in bondage of the of uh, uh, Pharaoh in Egypt. And there's a lot of typology in there, very interesting, where the you know the the uh, uh, Pharaoh is like a picture of of, of Lucifer, and uh, uh, Egypt was the system, and they were oppressing the people. They said, "We're not going to let them go." So God intervened using Moses, and there were dramatic events that took place after that, and the ten plagues, and there's a lot to be said about that. Why? Let my people go. It was let my people go, and that was even in uh, our modern expression of slavery in America. The, the the cry came up, "Let my people go." There was a there was a connection to that uh, that biblical uh, account of of Jewish. Uh, the Jewish nation. So people are going to fight for freedom. Now that fight can be a prayer fight. It can be a, it can be a, a more spiritual one. It doesn't have to be necessarily physical, although at times it may require that. The next is in this cycle is, is liberty, which is the same as freedom. Prosperity and freedom are then achieved. There's a breakthrough. You sign the peace agreement, right? And, uh, and, and then th there's, there's freedom. Whether it was Nazi Germany, uh, or other major conflicts to world wars. What was all about that about? The, the German nation wanted to put other nations under their uh, control. Who rules? We, we, we suppress you, uh, we destroy you, and we take your stuff. And then you do what we're told, or we're going to, you're, you're going to pay the price for it. 
so the fight went on, and ultimately the, the, the peace agreement is signed, and now you're free. Say you're free. And the Jewish people were in, in change there again. They were in the concentration camps. They opened the gates, and now you're free. So the yearning of the heart of man is to be free, but the powers of darkness, how the enemy, demonic power, and Lucifer operate, is to put men in bondage. <clears throat> and this is one of the... I say the, the grand comparisons in humanity is the comparison between bondage and freedom at many, many different levels. We're looking at the macro level of nations, but it, has, it comes down to us individually, whether you personally are in bondage or you are, or you are personally free. And we'll talk about that in a moment. The next level on this cycle is abundance. The focus turns to material things. Now you've got freedom and everything is going well, and now you're developing an economy, and you're becoming more and more wealthy, and you're, uh, you are prosperous in your, as a nation, or as an individual, we'll talk about that in a moment, which eventually turns into the next level and what becomes troubling, which is s selfishness, which is the all about me and my stuff realm. Now, all of a sudden, you're thinking about America and how we have moved from being in bondage and then being free and then being prosperous and the, uh, the Industrial Revolution and then we have a war and then we're, we're, we rescue people out of that, we pay the price, we, uh, we have a civil war, it's all war, you know, and then out of that comes freedom. And I'll tell you in a moment, but it's in your list, but uh, number two on your list, someone always has to die for the freedom of another. Somebody's paying a price for the freedom of somebody else. Somebody's fighting, and sometimes real physical fighting, and they, 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 they die physically. They make the ultimate sacrifice. Of course, with Christ, he was, he was the one who fought the fight, and he, he laid down his life. For what, for what? For our freedom. Somebody has to die for somebody else's freedom. Somebody has to lay down their life. Now, it may be that somebody lays down their life as a prayer warrior, and they're laying down their life that way and interceding for someone else's salvation. And they're giving themselves, they're giving out of themselves to see someone else set free. And they don't, might not necessarily die physically, but there's a death to self-life where they dedicate themselves to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to a cause. I'm thinking now about uh, uh, child uh, slavery and the little girls that they get to, the sex slaves, and they have a few people, I don't know the names offhand, but they are going out into these very dangerous areas where they have these children, and they rescue these children that are in child uh, slavery. And, uh, and the little girls are, are used in the sex trade, and they lay down their life going in there and rescuing those children. Now, they could die, but they're, they're laying down their life. So, Freedom oftentimes requires somebody else to lay down their life for uh, the one in bondage. Selfishness begins to take over, and the next, le the next in the cycle is something called complacency. Uh, a feeling of entitlement and, and self-absorption. Now, it would appear to me that we're already moved into that, into that mindset in America. Complacency, entitlement, self-absorption. You just think, well, I'm free and I get everything I want now. And uh, it, the, somebody should give me what I need in life. And, uh, and there are certain doctrines that have been developed, which is now it's called DEI, which is uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity. The DEI movement, diversity, inclusion, and equity. Now, equity is a very interesting word. It's not equality. It's equity. Equity is socialism and communism in that, in that formula. And most people don't know it. Oh, diversity and inclusion, wonderful. And, and equity, everything is equitable. Well, equi uh, uh, being equitable is different than equality. Equality is when there's, there's equal opportunity for all people to prosper as they apply their skills and they are educated and they are responsible and they show up for their job and they, in, and they move up through, a, through the uh, uh, business world and, uh, and achieve. Equity is different. That is looking for equal outcome. In other words, in communism, regardless of what you do, you get the same outcome. So a person, it's almost like being in a, in a college course, 
and uh, and w you're working very hard on your on that degree and uh, someone over here is not showing up and they're not studying and they this person gets an A and the other person who's not studying gets an F but at the end of the course you get your grade and everybody gets a C because that's equitable so in other words equal outcome so the idea in communism is everybody works and does their, their workers' party. You do is you're a doctor and you're a, a, you know, a nice, wonderful plumber over here. Your salary is the same as this doctor over here. It does, and if you're not even doing that much, you should get some kind of a salary. So in our country, they're already promoting this, that even with uh, illegal aliens, people who have, who have broken the law to get in the country, that in, I think it's, they are promoting this in uh, California of all places, that everybody gets a monthly salary. That you actually get a check every month, you get a, a, a salary to live on, and you don't have to do anything. So. Uh, guess what? Uh, a lot of people are living on the streets out there in, in California because there's no requirement to do anything. The one gentleman, he escaped the bondage of that system because it's a control of the government saying, you look to us and, if, and uh, we will supply your needs and we want to make this equitable. And he, and he escaped the system and he came out and saying, they are enablers because they're living on the street and they come by every day to give you free stuff and a free phone and a free tablet and free food, free, 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 free. And there's no motivation to escape. But the mindset is communism. It's communism light, that's socialism, which is we, we want everybody to have the same thing, uh, the same house, the same car, the same uh, salary, that's equity, diversity, inclusion, equity. So whenever you hear that, you know that's communism. And we don't agree with that because it's contrary to freedom, because the government then uh, has domination over you. And then the next area is apathy in the cycle. And that is personal responsibility is lost. And we get into the it's not my fault mentality which is whatever happens in my life where I fail and I, and I don't have a job and I'm poor, I blame it on someone else. Rather than taking personal responsibility, I frame it as I have been victimized by a, uh, an evil culture and they have done this to me and that's why I'm in this condition. Rather than being personally responsible and being a good worker and being respectful and doing the hard work, education and so forth, I don't do those things. I'm apathetic, really pathetic, and I blame everybody else for my condition. And we can obviously agree that much of the culture has found its way into that box. And the next is the point of no return. This is the serious part of this cycle is the government achieves complete control over the people. And then we go back into bondage. Because government is given by God to manage over the people. And when righteous people rule, it's a good thing. Because in civil society, not everybody's a Christian. So there must be some, uh, in some level A, an authority over them. And there has to be laws and rules. And if you break them, there's certain you know, uh, recrimination. There are certain uh, penalties that have to be paid. And that's a good thing. Until the unrighteous rule. One of the founding fathers says this government is only good for those who are uh, moral people. The, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are all, only uh, effective with a moral people. When you have immoral people in a government, it's only a piece of paper. It can't make you do anything. It's only a piece of paper. So if you are a, when we have moral leaders, then we have, we have hope and, and freedom. That is why it's so vitally important when we vote that we vote for people who are it's the, the most moral people in the, in the contest. Amen? In your list, in your general principles of freedom, Number one, freedom is not the natural condition of mankind. Number two, someone always has to die for the freedom of another. Number three, the condition of freedom has to be maintained. We must maintain freedom. 
if we are negligent, we can easily be, over time, lose that freedom. So there must be a, a, a maintenance to the freedom. We have to be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, roams as a lion. We all know that scripture. Number four, freedom can be lost through neglect. And that's what we just studied there, the, the Titler principle. All as you need, all as we need as a nation to lose our freedom is to neglect being involved in the course of our nation in not only voting, but being in office and being people who are involved in the culture as moral people. Number six, the greatest enemy of freedom is apathy. Comes from the Titler, uh, I'm sorry, number five. Someone, someone or some entity is always seeking to bring you into bondage. We'll look at that in a moment. And that is in the, certainly in the natural realm. Uh, drug, drug dealers want to bring you into bondage and control you through the drug. They themselves rarely take the drugs. They will allow you to take one. Matter of fact, the first one's free. It's on the house. Why? To bring you into bondage. So somebody is always, people, want, people love to be, uh, control you. That, that's what the, the, the lower part of the human nature wants. I want to control you. I want to be above you. I want to dominate you. And that has many, many forms. And uh, so someone, or a government, uh, an unrighteous government, th their goal is to control you at, at as many levels as they can. And uh, it's just, a, it's, a, it is a, it's the darkness that is in the heart of man as sinners. Six, the greatest enemy of freedom, freedom is apathy. It's, uh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, the Laodicean church. Think of the Laodicean church. He said they, they, were, uh, they were all lukewarm and did not know. They were unaware that they were, they were wicked and wretched and, and blind and naked. They didn't even know it because it, they, had all, they had been overwhelmed with their prosperity. Everything was good. Their churches were nice. They had the buildings. They had everything looking good. And they were unaware of their spiritual condition. You know how many people qualify in that? They can come and sit in a building and be wretched and blind and naked, and they don't even know how pathetic their spiritual condition is. And it comes from neglect. They lost their first love. That's the Ephesians, the Ephesus, Church of Ephesus. They, we lose that first love. But how? Neglect. How, how, why do marriages fall apart over time? One word. Neglect. It's apathy. Just taking things for granted. But you don't know what you have until you lose it. Why do you lose it? Apathy and neglect. So as believers, one of the tragedies is, well, I got saved and now I'm going to just live whatever I want. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be in Bible study, uh, attending church. Ah, if I feel like it, I'll go. Maybe I will. And, and yet the Bible says, do not neglect assembling. Do not neglect do not neglect assembling yourselves together, as is the habit of some, but, but encourage one another all the more so as you see the day of the Lord coming. You know how many in, the, in, in their own minds say, I'm not going to go. I'll stay at home and I'm going to watch a streaming. Streaming is not fellowship. That is not gathering yourselves together. But in your own deception, now you're falling away and you don't read as much. You don't pray as much. And you're moving back towards bondage ever so slowly by degree. It's the old picture of the frog in the, in the water that you turn up the heat and one degree at a time and pretty soon the, he's a uh, he's boiled frog. All life comes down to who rules. Romans 8 2 says this, there's two laws. I have a message, the duality of life, there's always twos. Two trees in the garden, there's two human beings there, there's two roads, there's two laws, there's uh, two destinations, there's two roads, there's, there's, there's two houses, you know, the one on the sand and the one on the rock. It all comes down to twos. Well, there's two laws, they're found in, in Romans 8, 2. For the, the law of the spirit of life is in Christ Jesus. There's a law. All those who are born again come under that law, it's the law of life in Christ Jesus. Who has made me free, there it is. Uh, the, the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ, in our salvation, has made me free. You shall know the truth. The truth shall you set you free, make you free. And wh whom the Son sets free is free. All right, free indeed. That's a good freedom. That's you're really, really free. 
that Lord has made me free from this, the law of sin and death. That's another law. Well, whoever is not in Christ is, is living out of that law. And it's, and it's another way to say they're, <clears throat> that they're living in bondage. Now, the, 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 uh, 2 Corinthians 3.17, now the, now the law, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom or, or, or liberty. Luke 4.18, just going to give you some quick verses here. When, when Jesus picks up the scroll and reads from Isaiah, the, I think it's 60, there, one, one through about five, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach what? Deliverance to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are, that are bruised. See, they're, they're in bondage, even to their bruising. Bruising means when they've been, uh, uh, they have been offended in their life, they've been mistreated in their life, and because they live out of that victimhood, they're not free. So the Lord says, I'm going to set you free of, that, of, of your past uh, abuses. I'm going, to, I'm going to set you free. There's much more to be said about that. And, of course, John 8, 31 to 32, if you, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. With, with the focus is on responsibility, if you continue in my word. You know how many con Christians do not continue in the word? But it's not only just reading it. Continue means to be abide in and live in and live through and apply the word in their life. If they do that, then uh, <clears throat> uh, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 and the, and the very God of peace will sanctify you wholly and I pray God your whole, listen to it, spirit and soul and body, three parts of us, that's our, our, we're, we're our tripartite being, spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless, sound and complete unto the coming of the Lord. So we have those three areas of our life that are always at play and the Lord wants to set us free in each one of them. First of all, your physical body, give me a few minutes here, Colossians 3, 5, and he says this, so to the Colossian church, and this is reference to sins of the body, you know, uh, bad appetites, um, uh, addictions, addiction to, you know, we're a, an addicted population. They say like five out of ten people is addicted to somebody, something. Now, there's the dark addictions, you, you, you know, I know it's, are there any smokers in here? No, no smokers in here. But smoking and drinking and drugging. But how about food addiction? They say amen or oh me. See, see if, if food, you know, you can be addicted to food. You can be addicted to, you know, darker things. You know, people get into pornography, dark. You can be addicted to screens. You can be addicted to games. Too much of something. You're addicted to it because that's kind of what's, what your great passion of life can be, a gamer. How do you define yourself? Well, I'm a gamer. And uh, that can be also an addiction. And there are a lot of the, the, those darker uh, gambling. How about that? People play the lottery. I mean, people play the lottery. They're gamblers, right? They're gambling. And they get addicted to that kind of stuff. So what, is, what does Paul say by the Spirit to Colossians? Colossians 3, 5. He says, so kill, deaden, and deprive of power, reading from the Amplified here, the evil desires lurking in your members. Those, he writes this, those animal impulses and all that is earthly in you that is em, employed in sin. He said deaden that. Deprive it of its power. Okay, so what, do you, what does one do? Or whatever it is you have, uh, if you're addicted to sugar, just throwing something out there, what you might do is to get rid of all the sugar in your pantries because you're addicted to sugar. Now, I know I'm talking to somebody in here right now. <clears throat> now, there are worse addictions. But you say, well, how do I deprive it of, my, of its power? Well, I'm not going to buy it and put it in my cabinets. And <clears throat> I'm, I, they play these games. I'm going to take the games out because it's become unhealthy. I hit the button and it erases the whole game. And you, you have to recover. It takes a little while to uh, detox from you can't, it's like the kid, you know, you take their phone away, they're going to have a psychological breakdown anymore. Why? An addiction to the phone. You can't, you don't have your phone. It's like not having your watch or your wallet with you anymore. I'm talking to somebody out there. Romans 8, 13. 
Well, anyway, he, they gives a little, let, let me go, go back. He, he goes through a little bit of list of, and this is to the church, this is to the Colossians. Sexual vice, impurity, uh, <clears throat> sensual appetites, unholy desires, this is his list, and all greed and all covetousness, so, which is idolatry, the de deifying of self, and other created things instead of God. So he's writing to the believers there, and this is something that you ask the Lord, are, is there something in my life that my physical animal, this animal instinct of my body is craving? I crave this. I, I really can't do without it. That's what we're talking about. And the Lord says, I want you to be free. That you don't require that. You don't have to have that gallon of ice cream, uh, you know, all night long eating ice cream. Chocolate chip mint. I know I'm treading on uh, sacred ground here, but what is it that you say, I just can't get it. I have to have. And, and, she was, and the Lord said, no, uh, I want to hand it over. Listen to this, Romans 8, 13. For if we live according to the flesh, the dictates of the flesh, you'll surely die. But if you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are habitually putting to death, there's the same thing, this mortifying, putting to death, <clears throat> making extinct and deadening the evil deeds prompted by the body, you shall really and genuinely live forever. Say, so, okay, does that, does, that, does that speak to us in some way? So we're talking about the body. We have to be engaged in that by the power of the Spirit, which is the love of God, and saying, my being in bondage to that thing, it says in uh, Hebrews 12, 1, it says, putting aside every encumbrance and that sin that, uh, that dominates you and controls you. That's, what is that? That one that you're, you're struggling with. He said, deal, deal with that. How? By the power of the Spirit. What is that? Because you love God so much, you say, I, I'm going to... Get rid of this by God's grace. Uh, this is out of my life because it does not honor God and doesn't bring Him glory, and I'm done with it. And you take a stand, and you, and you fight for that freedom. I, I ask people, how, don't raise your hand. How many people are, are free? I mean, you're free in, in the, <clears throat> physically. You're free in, the, in, the, in your soul, in your emotions, in your mind, in your, in your spirit. You say, I am Absolutely free. I'm free indeed. And very few people, I think, can raise their hands and say, I'm free. I'm free of fear. I'm free of worry. Uh, I'm free of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, excessive whatever it is put, put on the list. I'm, I'm free of that. I walk in freedom. That's God's will for us. The devil says, I want a piece of you, buddy, sister. I want a piece of you. I, wanna, I want to have you under my control in this area of your life, and I'm not letting you go. And that's where you need to say, no. Jesus said, I'm, I'm going to take this Bible, I'm going to take that truth, I'm going to take faith and apply it to it, and because I love God so much, and through the love of God, which is the power of God, I'm going to, I'm going to live in, as an overcomer. The Bible says, whatever a, man, <clears throat> by, whatever a man is overcome, the same he is in bondage. Whatever you're overcome by, whatever you can't not do, you're in bondage to that thing. <clears throat> Secondly is the bondage to the soul, which is your mind and your emotions. That's from your past, <clears throat> and it also is the future. The past is guilt, shame, failure, offenses, bitterness, resentment, all victimhood, which is basically unfor unforgiveness. All of that from the past, if, you are, if you've not resolved those issues, you're in bondage to it. And the devil will keep you there and say, oh, poor you, and so-and-so did this to you, and so-and-so did that to you. And how unfair that is, and how you are justified in your resentment, in your bitterness, and, and you, were, you did this back there, and this sin is in your past, and uh, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, and I have a little guilt back there. So the devil throws some condemnation on you. That is bondage. That is bondage. And you say the only, that has to be resolved and primarily is through forgiveness. That's the main mechanism there the, uh, of, of uh, uh, freedom is, is for forgiveness and applying it. The other is the future, which is the what if mindset. And that's the, that's the fear factor. God has not given us spirit of fear, but I like this. The power of what? The power of what? Love. The power of love and, and, uh, and a sound mind. So, so soundness of mind is really something that's birthed out of the love of God. 
And uh, <clears throat> so fear, the spirit of fear is right from hell itself. It's a spirit. And it says, what if this happens? Well, I'm, I've got the victory and all this. Yeah, but what about this? What about that? What if he does this? What if she does that? What if the future here? What if you can't do this? And what if you have a heart attack? What if you do this? And that's fear and anxiety. And we have to take the Word of God and apply it to it because it's the truth that set us free. So Matthew 6, 30 through 31, we know it pretty well. There's a whole section in there where Jesus said, do not worry. Do not worry about today. Today has enough for, for tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough struggles of its own. Matthew 6, 30, 31. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? See, the, it's a, he said, you're not believing God. You're worrying? What are you worrying about? What's the worry come from? Does not the word say, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches? Seek, seek, seek his, him and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Does not say that. What shall we eat? <clears throat> and 31 says, you Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these. What things? The things that the Gentiles seek after. He said, I'll add them all to you because I take care of the birds and the grass and the lilies of the field. And as you know, they're beautiful, but they're, you're my son. You're my daughter. How much more? So it's a faith issue. Do, do we believe that? Because worry is a denial of that truth. Worry is saying, I don't believe God is going to take care of me. And that would be sin before the Lord. And we have to deal with that on that level. <clears throat> fear of death. Another big fear. Fear of dying. So why, why fear of dying? I mean, uh, when you think about it, we don't die. We just change locations. Amen? Listen to it. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took a part of the same, that <clears throat> through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Fifteen. Hebrews 2.15, and deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. See, there's bondage again. So all of life, you're in bondage or you're free. <clears throat> fear of death is actually bondage, but we're set free because we know Christ and we know the, uh, our, our destination. And then finally, the spiritual, <clears throat> spiritual bondage, <clears throat> which is... Deception of <clears throat> ideological, political bondage. It's any, any level of oppression and possession. It's a spiritual realm. Galatians 5.1. <clears throat> Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty of the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. And that was, of course, written to the, to the Galatian church that were being brought under a religious bondage that they had to follow the law to ultimately become a Christian and get into heaven. What they're teaching was this. In order to be a Christian, you had to first be a Jew. That was the idea. You had to be a Jew, and you got to get a circumcision and the laws, and now you can, now you can be a, a Christian. And, of course, Paul was addressing that and saying, that's heresy, and it brings people under bondage to the law, which... which was uh, his, uh, which is his focus. Amplified Bible says this, in this freedom has made us free, have it up on the screen, stand fast. Everybody say that. Stand fast. Do not come under spiritual tyranny of leaders that will cause you to follow them and to obey them and, and put you under bondage to a, a, a unique doctrine. Do not be hampered or ensnared and, su and submit again to a yoke of slavery uh, which you had once put off. In uh, Galatians 2, 4, it says this, and that because, his false brethren, because of the false brethren, of false brethren un <clears throat> crept in unawares. They brought in with them. They came in to spy out our liberty. See, there's the freedom. Uh, these religious people came in and they said, well, you're, you have this freedom in Christ. We want to bring you under our laws so you are, uh, we might fundamentally dominate you. That freedom which we have in Christ Jesus that, may, that they might bring us into bondage. 
Now, doctrinal spiritual bondage is probably one of the most powerful of all of these. Cults, all cults, are the result of spiritual bondage. A, a spiritual leader enticed uh, individuals to come under their doctrine. They have a unique doctrine, and ultimately they would promote a doctrine that would say, in order to find your way to God, in order to get into heaven, you have to follow this doctrine. If you don't follow this doctrine, you will then be lost forever. That's Jehovah's Witnesses, that is Mormons, and other religious cults. They're saying, if you're not part of our group, you're, gonna, you're not going to live. <clears throat> While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. <clears throat> For of whom a man is overcome, that's a religious leader, of the same he is brought into bondage. Right? Bondage. Hallelujah. You get something out of that? All right, let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for this, share a few of these scriptures, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we as a people, as a congregation, would walk in, in, in freedom. And, and, uh, and, and be free indeed, in Jesus' name. Amen.